Welcome to Public Health Matters, the show that addresses public health issues that matter the most to the citizens of Harford County. Real issues, real people, and the information you need to know. Hello, I'm Molly Mraz, Public Information Officer for the Harford County Health Department and your host for today's Public Health Matters. It's the show that takes a closer look at the public health issues that matter the most to the citizens of Harford County. Today we are going to talk about HIV and PrEP and how one pill taken daily can help lower your chances of getting infected. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, in 2017, over 38,000 people received an HIV diagnosis in the United States. The annual number of new HIV diagnoses has remained stable in recent years in the United States. However, annual new diagnoses have increased among some groups. And locally, in Harford County, about 488 individuals are living with HIV today. Joining me to talk about these topics are Zach Kaczynski, Regional Prep Navigator for the Harford County Health Department, and Jeffrey Hitt, Director of the Infectious Disease Prevention and Health Services Bureau for Maryland Department of Health. Welcome to our show and thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Sure. So let's start off um, just talking about what each of you do at the at your your role within the state and the health department. Do you want to start? I'll start. Uh, sure. Uh, as the bureau director, I'm an administrator for a large number of people who do all sorts of activities around HIV, sexually transmitted infections, and hepatitis. So we collect data and uh, write reports on the data. We administer funding and programs uh, to support people living with HIV, to uh, help diagnose HIV, and also uh, to connect people to treatment, and also to help prevent HIV. Very nice. So your program works very closely with Zach's program. Indeed, yes, yes. So we have we have uh, Jeff's area to thank for our funding that helps support us on the local level here in Harford County. Um, I'm the regional prep navigator for Harford County. I also work with the health departments in Cecil, Kent, and Queen Anne's counties to provide technical assistance, capacity building, um, support the prep programs that each of those local health departments have. I also do a lot of outreach and education locally in Harford County um, to help folks understand more about um, how HIV is transmitted, how they can protect themselves, and if someone is HIV positive, how they can get connected with treatment. Okay, very interesting. So Jeff, can we start with you, and can you just talk about what HIV is, how it's contracted, things like that? Sure. Uh, HIV stands for Human Immunodeficiency Syn uh, Virus. <laughs> Sorry. And, uh, and HIV is a, is a virus that infects the immune system, so that's where the name comes from. It's transmitted sexually, uh, most commonly, but also through the sharing of uh, needle sharing equipment if people are injecting drugs. It can be passed from mother to child through, uh, during pregnancy. Uh, those are the uh, primary ways that, uh, that HIV is transmitted. Okay. Um, what about myths that they're, they're associated myths with HIV? Sure. Um, I, I think uh, understanding transmission is is really important. You cannot get HIV from casual contact. You can't get it from kissing. You can't get it from sharing utensils or eating the same food, uh, drinking from the same glass, sharing uh, public facilities or the environment. None of those things will uh, will uh, make you contract HIV. I think you had said mm -hmm. previously about I think there was a story a while back about a family who made their HIV-infected child eat off of different oh, dinner plates. Well, actually, uh, they chose to. Uh, even, even people uh, with HIV sometimes don't understand exactly how it's transmitted. And uh, we have come across instances where people were, you know, eating off paper plates and, and using separate utensils so that they wouldn't, you know, uh, put their families at risk. That's really not necessary, and no one should be afraid of people with HIV. That's a good mm. message. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think um, for years there's been, is it okay to talk a little bit about stigma now? Sure. Yeah, so for years there's been a lot of stigma. Um, especially in the early days of the HIV right. AIDS epidemic. 
um, that affected people living with HIV. Um, a big part of that comes from the fact that there were, there were some specific groups that were predominantly affected by HIV. Um, a large number of their early infections were, were in these groups. Uh, and because of that, a lot of the folks that weren't necessarily as at high risk saw these groups as possibly disease vectors, someone who could, who could infect them. Um, and that, that made people treat people as disease vectors and not necessarily as people, which is what we know them to be. Um, nowadays, thankfully, we have a lot more information and we, we, we think, we believe that a lot of this stigma has, has decreased, has gone away, um, but it is still very much there, still very much there. And I think what Jeff said definitely illustrates that. Right. So you were talking about certain groups of people that mm -hmm. are affected by HIV. Who is most at risk for HIV? So I think Jeff talked about some of the primary ways that you can contract HIV through sexual exposure, um, as well as sharing of drug use equipment. And so folks who engage in uh, higher risk sex, that might put them at risk for HIV, as well as those who engage in injection drug use, um, those are folks. And, and we know that men who have sex with men in that community, um, we have higher rates of HIV infection. That's sort of one of the groups that it really impacted in the early days of the epidemic, and that's really, it's really kind of stayed consistent in that network. Okay, how would someone know if they had HIV? What are some signs and symptoms? Well, so there, there aren't a lot of signs and symptoms. There are sometimes some vague symptoms when people are first infected, and so they might uh, have a mild fever or some very nonspecific uh, um, symptoms. Uh, the, the best thing for people to do is to get tested. The CDC recommends that everyone get tested for HIV at least once. Mm -hmm. And if you're at higher risk, you should get tested annually or even more frequently. So, um, so getting a test is the way to, to know for sure. And I think that is stigma still exists and fear mm -hmm. still exists around HIV testing. And so even the test itself, people may sometimes avoid, but there really is no reason to avoid that. Uh, testing it helps you know, and if you know, then you can take the right actions to preserve your health. Mm -hmm. And Jeff, if I can interject and add to that, um, I'm going to say this multiple times throughout the program, but we have free HIV testing available at the Harford County Health Department at multiple locations. So please, if you haven't been tested, if you're interested, you just want to get a follow-up test, we do have that available. What's your phone number? 410-612-1779 is to my local office um, where we have that testing available. Yeah, and you do you have walk-in hours? Not at our location, but okay. we can help folks on a regular basis. And Molly, what's the, what's the number for the Maine Health Department? I think they're able to connect with health <laughs> services there. Uh, it's 410-838-1500. Yeah, and I think if someone calls that and asks and asks for HIV testing, they can also go to our other, lo other location where we offer that those yeah. testing services on a walk-in basis. Okay, see I put you on the spot for a phone number and you're putting me on the <laughs> spot for a phone number. <laughs> yeah, they, we definitely can can help anybody who's looking for HIV testing. Um, and like you were saying, it's not, it's a finger prick, right? And it's done within mm -hmm. minutes? Yes, there, well, there's a lot of different testing technologies. Uh, you can get a lab-based test and uh, you can get a test at your doctor's office or, um, uh, but there are point of care tests that uh, use mm -hmm. just a drop of blood and, uh, and the result is available within minutes. Yeah, and so the test that we utilize at the Harford County Health Department for a rapid testing, um, it is just a finger prick. Um, sort of folks who are, you know, have had any exposure to people getting their insulin levels, um, their sugar levels checked, um, if they're, they have diabetes, it's that same sort of process of a little finger prick. We get a little bit of blood, and within 20 minutes, we have a, a, a result for an HIV test. We can tell folks their status. Okay, so if you have, if you have an STD, do you automatically have HIV? Like, what's oh, the no. relationship between... Um, HIV and other sexually transmitted diseases? So uh, they all share a common pathway for mm -hmm. spreading and that's really the thing that, that uh, re relates them to each other. Um, most, a lot of other STDs are uh, bacterial. Uh, they're not viruses, so uh, and, uh, there are some viruses as well, but, um, uh, but they really just share a common method. Um, you can have HIV and, uh, and not have S any other STDs, or you can get an STD and not get HIV. So when I think about STDs, I'm talking about gonorrhea, chlamydia, uh, syphilis, uh, herpes. 
those are those are different than HIV. Right. And so what if, if someone was diagnosed with HIV, what are some ways that they can stay healthy? Um, since their immune system's compromised, what other ways can they stay healthy to well, most importantly is to is to take antiretroviral medication. So there are lots of medications for uh, treating HIV, and successful treatment of, of your HIV will will keep the the virus uh, to, um, suppressed, so that you uh, won't transmit the virus, and uh, also it won't uh, impact your health. So uh, getting on a daily antiretroviral treatment is really, really important. Uh, otherwise, it's, uh, it's healthy activities that, that anyone uh, should uh, engage in, staying healthy, eating good foods, uh, um, appropriate exercise. So, yeah. All the difficult stuff. Yes. Yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that the, it's changed, I mean, it has changed since the 80s treatment mm -hmm. Um, you know, how we view the stigma has changed a little bit. So do you want to go into that and talk about how much treatment's improved since, since the 80s and HIV first? Sure. Yeah, um, a lot, a lot. There were the, the medications that we first had available for folks who were living with HIV, um, they had high levels of toxicity. They had a lot of side effects that impacted people's bodies in ways that weren't ideal, but still helped keep them alive from HIV. It was our best, it was what was available at the time. Um, since then, we made a lot of pharmaceutical and other medical advancements. Nowadays, people have to be on fewer medications. We have better treatments that target different specific strains of the HIV virus, whatever a person may have. Um, and we have a lot, lot fewer side effects. So as Jeff was saying, for most people who get on that daily regimen of highly active antiretroviral therapy, um, folks who are newly diagnosed with HIV nowadays can expect to be on fewer medications with fewer side effects with more effective treatment results. And there's no cure for HIV. That's correct. So, uh, so we have uh, treatments that work, but you're required to be on them for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which would in turn, HIV does turn into AIDS. Uh, it does, although if you uh, are on medications and, uh, and your virus is suppressed, then you're not likely to progress to AIDS. Okay. AIDS is really just a, an advanced stage of HIV infection mm -hmm. uh, in which the immune system is significantly compromised. Right. I think this topic is so important because I think there are so many unanswered questions about HIV and AIDS. I think because people are so afraid to ask these questions mm -hmm. and really find out, um, almost like it's you know like a dirty illness or something, but really it's not. And mm -hmm. you know anybody is at risk for contracting HIV, and just because it turns it, it could possibly turn into AIDS doesn't mean doesn't necessarily mean it's a death sentence either, right? And I mean, no. With treatments now, uh, uh, people people with HIV can expect to live a, a lifespan that really um, approaches that of a normal uh, uninfected person and a, a normal lifespan. So, uh, so the outlook for people with HIV is uh, better than ever. It's still not easy, uh, you know, and you have to take the medication every day. Uh, uh, for the rest of your life, mm -hmm. so so that's a that's a challenge for people. That right. can be quite a challenge. Yes, so. for sure. I think when when we speak about you know HIV still progressing to AIDS for some folks, that really just has to do with access to treatment and the ability mm -hmm. to do it. And so that's one reason we really want to get the word out there about testing, encourage yeah. people to do that, encourage people to ask questions about things that you know if you're not sure, it's okay to ask. Right. And the health department can definitely be a resource for that. We also encourage people to talk to their primary care providers if they have concerns. Um, but the more that we do, the more that we do away with that stigma and get the education and information out there, the more people will know their HIV status and those who are positive can get linked to treatment, um, which then really, really increases you know, the likelihood that they're gonna have a long, healthy life. So you brought up an interesting point about access to care being an issue for the disease turning into AIDS and so do you find that there are certain pockets that are more prone to HIV 
turning into AIDS versus other well, areas? I think anyone who's experiencing barriers to accessing care, whether that's, uh, you know, poverty uh, can play into that. Um, uh, lots of other factors can play into whether you're able to maintain adherence to the medication. Mm -hmm. And it's really, it's not really that much different from any, uh, any long-term chronic disease maintenance. Um, there are always going to be struggles with, with adherence to medication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, feeling like you have a provider, a physician, doctor, whatever kind of provider that may be, who understands where you're coming from, understands your life and can communicate with you right. um, is something we know is hugely, hugely important right. for being able to access and stay in care. Um, and so sometimes we see, you know, intercultural communication, people coming from very different backgrounds than where their provider's coming from, and that can really cause sort of a rift in communication. Right. Um, I know we have a lot of Spanish-speaking folks in Harford County, mm -hmm. and if we don't have a provider that speaks Spanish and is able to communicate one-on-one -on -one with a patient, it can make it a lot more difficult for that patient to access care and, right. and to stay in care. So yeah. it's, it's those sorts of things, trying to tear down barriers um, and really get providers and patients to know that, and, to a place where they're able to connect one-to-one. -one. Right. I think that would really do a lot in yeah. our county. Yeah, and we're trying to, as you know, Zach, talk more about um, health literacy and cultural competency. Mm -hmm. And Very important. It is really important because, you know, people are unsure about what they're being prescribed, maybe how often they need to take a medication. I mean, like, you can look at a prescription bottle and it could just say, take one pill daily for two weeks and then, you know, switch to a third of a pill. No, you know, not that extreme. But it's medication math. But it's, it's hard easy. sometimes, yeah. And then the adherence to medication, like, I can't take medicine every day. There's no way. I just don't, I just don't remember. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so people with HIV face those same challenges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I bet. And the cultural competency, I mean, it's really important to reach those individuals who do speak Spanish, who, you know, and we just try and make sure that we're trying to make sure that, that we're mm -hmm. reaching um, everyone in the county. Um, and I'm sure the state's doing the same thing. I mean, just really trying to put a huge focus on you know, health literacy and cultural competency within the mm -hmm, county. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad you brought that up, Zach. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. I, I feel it's very important. It is I'm very glad important. glad we see eye to eye. It's good stuff. So let's talk about um, PrEP. So mm -hmm. that is a huge accomplishment over the past couple of years. And so um, both of you work daily with PrEP. And so, Jeff, do you want to start off and just kind of talk about what PrEP is? Sure. So PrEP, first of all, PrEP stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is sounds very fancy, but it uh, let's break that down. Prophylaxis is protection, mm -hmm. and pre-exposure just means before you're exposed to HIV, you're protected, you're treated. So, uh, so PrEP uh, is is a, a treatment drug that people who are not HIV positive, who are not infected, can take, and it protects them from, uh, from HIV if they are exposed. So uh, people at elevated risk can take PrEP, and, uh, and it will, uh, if they take it daily, it will keep the virus from taking hold okay. in the body and uh, keep them HIV negative. Okay, that's exciting for, for that. I mean, that's a huge it's, groundbreaking. It's a huge advancement in terms of adding another tool for HIV prevention. Yes. And so, mm -hmm. Zach, your role is to... To expand access to it. Yep. It's one, get the word out there so that people know that PrEP exists. Right. Um, that's a big thing, whether it's patients, folks in the community, and providers to know. Um, be able to identify patients that might be at elevated risk and connect them with PrEP. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's really my job, is to get the word out there, and then when people do express interest and it makes sense for them, to get them connected with it. Um, we also do, I, I spend some time working in three other counties, mm -hmm. in northeastern Maryland and the Upper Eastern Shore, to help them do the same sort of work that we're doing here. Um, we just think it's really, really important to, to get as many people possible connected with it. Right. Uh, it's, it's, we can prescribe and get access for somebody to prep in a, at a time period in their life when they may be at elevated risk, mm -hmm. right? And if we're able to do that and prevent that person from requiring HIV, some of the concerns that we have of long-term, lifelong adherence to HIV medications and all of the difficulties that come with that 
um, we're able to sort of avoid that. Now, we obviously have the still the same, you gotta take one pill once a day, mm -hmm. uh, but there are, there are some, that, there's a lower level of barrier there right. than there is with accessing um, HIV care, someone who is positive. Okay. So it's, it's just really exciting, we feel like we can get ahead of the virus right. a bit here. And so if you are taking PrEP, that doesn't mean that you still, that, that you should have unprotected sex or um, you shouldn't have to worry about anything. You still wanna make sure you're taking proper precautions. So we don't, you know, we don't ever wanna judge or shame anybody right. for what they're doing in bed or in any part of their personal lives. Um, and so obviously we do, PrEP is most effective when you combine it with other prevention tools. Okay. And I mean, we know about condoms, when mm -hmm. that that's one thing that's available there. And condoms also protect against a number of other STIs, including the, a lot of those bacterial ones that Jeff was talking about a little bit ago. Um, PrEP does not protect against those things. It's also not a contraceptive, contraceptive method, so mm -hmm. it doesn't prevent pregnancy. It's like other stuff you wanna combine with it. Right. Um, so I guess like bottom line is PrEP prevents HIV infection, right. not this other stuff. Right. So overall, for your overall sexual health and well-being, utilizing multiple HIV prevention, STI prevention, pregnancy prevention tools um, as it fits in an individual's life is really the best way to go. Um, but we work with folks who are interested in PrEP to kind of figure out what makes sense for them. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk to them about condoms, we talk to them about contraceptive, we talk to them about other, other methods of protection, um, and then they sort of get to decide what makes sense in their own personal lives. Right. Did you want to add something? Well, I, I just just to ditto everything that mm -hmm. he said. I think um, uh, it, it is important to uh, to keep in mind that prep doesn't protect you from from sexually transmitted infections or or prevent pregnancy. Um, it's important that uh, people continue to get tested for STDs uh, and get tested more often for sexually transmitted diseases, actually. So, uh, so but, uh, but we encourage people to engage in prevention wherever they are. And, uh, and, and PrEP is a tool for people who struggle with other methods. Mm -hmm. And Zach, at the health department, um, you also can connect them with PrEP, correct? 100%, 100%. Right. We, have, we have a PrEP program at the health department where mm -hmm. folks can come in. Um, we provide a whole slew of services in addition to just the testing and prescribing for PrEP. We do comprehensive STI testing and treatment. We can get folks connected with things ranging from insurance to transportation, um, vaccinations, other immunizations, things. We provide that stuff as well. Right. We can help people get linked to primary care. It really is sort of a you know, one-stop shop sort of thing and anything we can provide there on site we will do anything else that we can't we'll make sure that we help it, help a an individual get connected with those things if there was a call you know people are worried about insurance is there a cost barrier so to prep yeah so most major insurances you know you'll have your your lab and like for the lab work mm -hmm. and your visit copays that's sort of standard whatever comes with that um, the medication costs are really kind of where people get questions um, because if someone were paying out of pocket retail price, any medication could mm -hmm. get expensive. Um, so if someone comes in and has private insurance, we're able to get them connected with a copay assistance program. Um, and the manufacturer of the medication that we use for prep uh, will actually cover up to $7,200 in copay costs each year, okay. which for most people is more than enough. Right. Which is, it's really fantastic news. What that means is that for a majority of folks with, with private insurance, they can get prep essentially for free. For an okay. entire year, which That's is great, it's fantastic. It's that important. It is. It yeah. really is. So, uh, so coverage it, coverage by insurers is generally pretty good, and um, and where there are gaps, there are copay assistance programs that will mm -hmm. that will help people with the with the cost. Yeah, and if someone is uninsured, underinsured. Um, and or if they, if they qualify for Maryland medical assistance, mm -hmm. we have health insurance navigators on site right. in Edgewood at our clinic location that can help someone get signed up for insurance, pick the right plan for them, right. and, um, and figure out those co any cost barriers that are there. We really work really hard to, to get rid of those. Yeah. Um, and we have, we have additional funding sources that we're able to pull from on occasion if there's really, really a need and we're not able to figure out any other way to cover it for you. Um, bottom line is if someone's eligible for PrEP and they come in to see us and there are any cost barriers, we're going to do anything and everything we can to make sure that they can access it. Right. That's great. That's great. What about, can we just talk quickly about the side effects? If, you know, if you're taking PrEP for long term, does that cause any kind of side effects or? 
So, I mean, there are a, a few side effects. Um, uh, mostly, um, you need to have continu uh, regular check-ins with a doctor and check for liver and kidney functions just to make sure that that's working okay. Mm -hmm. um, uh, those are uh, pretty rare and um, uh, would come up fairly uh, soon after taking it, so uh, so monitoring with your physician is important, but they're relatively rare. Okay. Mm -hmm. I sort of compare it to, you know, you have a Brutter filter on your sink. Yeah. And you have a filter in there that strains it out. That's sort of what your kidneys do and your liver do with prep. Right. Is they're they're what metabolizes it and kind of empties it out of your body when it's all finished with it. Right. And you just got to get that filter checked. You just got to get that filter checked. Right. So that's what we do. You have somebody come in for their follow-up appointments, and we do blood work to make sure right. that everything's looking good. Some people experience slight headache and or nausea for a short period of time mm -hmm. once they start prep. Um, a lot of people that goes away within a week or two okay. and for everyone who experiences that side effect we haven't seen anybody experience anything after a month and that's once good. it goes away it doesn't come back. Oh that's good. So minimal side effects if yeah. any. Mm -hmm. Just like any other medication. So are you seeing an increase in individuals who are interested in taking PrEP? Do you feel that the word is still kind of it's not out there yet and we're just trying to educate individuals on PrEP so that they can get get on board? Yeah, I think I think it definitely varies by area. Yeah. I think in more urban metropolitan areas, we definitely have much higher rates of uptake. And a lot of that has to do with awareness, interest, being able to right. be connected to care. Um, out in somewhat more rural areas like Harford County, we're still really, really pushing to get the word out there. Um, so, I mean, we have, we have our work cut out for us, but yeah. we're committed to doing it. We think it's important. Right. Um, and, and we really hope that once we do get the word out and folks get connected with PrEP, who are eligible for it, that it'll really have an impact. Yeah, because it's a relatively new, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I just, we we at the state level have been working pretty hard to uh, help establish programs like the Harford yes. County program. We have programs in uh, in uh, 13 counties okay. now, including Harford. Um, so, uh, so we think it's uh, very important to get the word out, not just uh, to uh, potential uh, patients or clients, but uh, but also to providers. Right. There are a lot of providers who have barely heard of PrEP or mm -hmm. never heard of PrEP, and right. so we need healthcare providers uh, informed so that they can inform their, their patients. Right. You gentlemen do such great work. We're out of time, but I thank you so much for the work that you do because it's so important, and, you're, and it's great because you're at the local level and you're at the state level, and you can just see the impact that your work is having at a local level, and it's just really um, admirable. So thank you so much for all the work that you do and that you thank do, you. Zach, at the health department. Yeah, thank you so and much for giving us this Sure, platform. sure. Thank you so much for being here. And that's all the time we have for today. I would like to thank my guests on today's show, Zach Kaczynski and Jeffrey Hitt. If you would like more information on PrEP and HIV, please refer to the resource page after this program and join us next time for another important health issue that matters the most to the citizens of Harford County. Thanks for watching. You've been watching Public Health Matters, brought to you as a public service by Harford Cable Network, your county connection.